All right, YouTube, how are you? Um, today, we're gonna do the big one. Um, the video that has probably been most requested by my subscribers and must get at least four or five messages a week going, can you do this? It's my all time favorite home computer and it celebrates its 20th birthday this month. We're gonna talk all about the Amiga 1200 in a moment. There's a little tease for you. Uh, first of all, I've got to apologize for the look today. I know I urgently need a haircut and a shave. I'm a bit of a scruffy bastard at the moment, but it's a Sunday, you know, I'm taking it easy. Uh, before we get into the Amiga 1200 video though, I want to quickly talk to you about two books. Uh, so you know I've recommended um, some good reading material if you're a, a Commodore or Amiga fan before. Now there is one book that's probably one of the most uh, famous recent Commodore books, uh, Commodore, A Company on the Edge. Now if you haven't read this before, um, this is really fascinating. It's uh, written by Brian Bagnall. Originally this came out, the first edition of it was uh, a single volume hardback book. Uh, this is the second edition, um, where he's actually gone a lot more in depth and got a lot of new interviews. Uh, so much new material in fact, he's actually split the book into two volumes now. So the, um, the first volume of it came out in 2010, I believe, which is the one I've got here. Uh, Commodore, a company on the edge it's called. Now the first volume uh, deals with the Jack Trammell years. Uh, a little bit of background about Jack and his early days and you know, founding Commodore as a typewriter company, which they originally were. Uh, the rise of the home computer market, uh, how Commodore decided to get into that business. Some of his uh, you know, underhanded business tactics that are very well documented. Um, and just a lot of interviews with guys like you know, Chuck Peddle, who was there at the time, and Bob Yans and people like that. People that really, you know, can give you the inside story. Now, this book covers from the 50s with Jack Trammell uh, up to around 1984 when he left Commodore and went to Atari. There is going to be a second edition of this book, which is due for release any day now, um, called Commodore The Amiga Years, and that will obviously cover 1985 up to the end of the company in 1994. So uh, I pre-ordered that actually, it was due out on Amazon at the start of November, it's now been delayed I think until January next year, but it's available for pre-order and uh, it is due any day now, so if you haven't read the first part of it, I highly recommend it. Commodore, A Company on the Edge by Brian Bagnall. Shouldn't say you back too much, actually. I got that for about 15 quid, I think. Another book that I've been reading, and uh, this is an e-book. I've been reading it on my iPad. Um, this is available on the Kindle store, and this got recommended to me on a forum. I hadn't heard about this book, but I've really been enjoying it so far. It's called Commodork, Sordid Tales from a BBS Junkie, written by uh, Rob O'Hara. Now, uh, this book, will really strike a chord if you were there um, at the early days of going online. It's basically a story about this, uh, it's a factual book, about this guy um, being a kid and getting into, you know, the Commodore 64 era. Um, he talked, you know, there's comments in here about, you know, computer fairs he'd go to and how they used to trade floppy disks and software piracy. And then about how he gets into uh, bulletin boards. And really the book is about that, the excitement of, you know, discovering this amazing online world and then he goes into how he set up his own bulletin board. So if you were there in that era, um, it really will strike a chord. I mean, you look at the picture there, you know, a kid in his Commodore 64 setup and his uh, 300 board modem. You know, it's really, really recommend reading it. I've really been enjoying that book. So there we go, a couple of reading recommendations and let's get onto the main subject of this video then. Now this is, as I mentioned, it's been one of the most requested videos and uh, I can see why, you know, this is probably my favorite home computer of all time we're gonna talk about and have a look at today. I am of course talking about the Commodore Amiga 1200. Now, this baby kind of uh, sprung onto the market 20 years ago. It was um, autumn 1992 this got released. And I still remember, bizarrely, um, the first ever time that I saw an Amiga 1200. I used to have a little computer store near me called, um, I think it was called Topsoft. Um, we lived in North Yorkshire at the time, Northeast Darlington. Um, and there was a little computer store in there, in a place called Clark's Yard. I think now, I went there recently, it's now some cocktail bar or something. But back then, you know, in the area, that was the main shop to go to for Commodore gear. They also covered a few other systems as well. But I remember going in the shop and they'd have like, you know, these big long workbenches along the back of the store with loads of machines all set up. You know, you, you go in there, there'd be a, an Amiga 500, there'd be a CDTV, uh, there'd be an Atari ST there, a Sega Mega Drive and a uh, Mega CD a SNES, all of that would be set up in the shop and you could go and play with it. Um, and I, I saw a lot of Commodore hardware for the first time in that shop, you know. I remember going in one day and seeing the Amiga 500 with the 
A570 CD-ROM attachment, which I later owned. And then one day I went in, just to have a look for, you know, some new games and some new hardware for my Amiga. And then I spied this machine on, on the bench at the back and I was like, you know, I hadn't heard anything about this. To me, it looked like an Amiga 600 with that had been stretched out to accommodate a numeric keypad, which design-wise is essentially what it is. I remember being like amazed by it. I remember it had a mouse as well. It was kind of a, you know, nice curved mouse, not the old tank mouse as it's nicknamed that you got with the A500. So I went over and had a little play with it and it was literally sitting on the the workbench um, Amiga OS desktop. Um, the only thing I remember different was it had like a, a white title bar. I remember thinking that looks a bit weird how they've done that. Uh, but yeah, I didn't really get what it was. I mean, I was like, what, what the hell is this new machine? Because bizarrely, it got um, announced here in the UK by Commodore at the start of November. And a lot of the magazine's deadlines were quite worked out. It didn't actually get any magazine coverage until after it had been released. I mean, it was in every Amiga mag, you know, a few weeks later. But yes, it kind of, you know, sprung out of me completely by surprise. Now, uh, to me, the A1200 is really the true spiritual successor to the Amiga 500. This is, you know, it was a hacker's machine. It was the ultimate games machine, the Amiga that, you know, all the kids at school in 92 and 93, you know, craved for. This was the machine that you wanted. It's also a little bit bittersweet as well that this was really Commodore's last, you know, really successful home computer probably. And um, it stayed with them right until the end of the company in 1994. It was really the last, you know, consumer uh, Amiga they built. Uh, they obviously had the CD32 that was aimed at the games market and the 4000 and the 4000 tower that were aimed at the high-end market. But this was the last machine that they made really, you know, for the people, for the, for the end user. It was affordable, it was released at £399. It was packing, you know, quite a bit of punch for the buck that you get, you know, it, for the money it was really pretty decently powered. I mean, a lot of people in hindsight are saying that it should have had higher specs and all that, but you remember this was £399. They were selling the Amiga 600 for that a month before, which, uh, as you'd imagine, probably pissed off a fair few people that paid 400 quid for an A600 in October. Um, but you look then, I mean, if you wanted to get a 386 PC, you're looking at a grand. This has set you back 399 quid. Now, Commodore made this until April 1994 when they went bankrupt. And then another company that bought Commodore's rights, um, Escom AG in Germany, re-released the Amiga 1200, which is actually the version I've got, mine's an Escom Amiga, um, in 1995. And I think they kept it on the market until 1997. So it had a pretty good run. It had two different owners. And it really it is, you know, to most Amiga fans, the Amiga 1200 is the machine that, you know, most warms their heart, really, the machine that brings back the most memories, and the machine that's been hacked to death to within an inch of its life since it got released. People are putting all kinds of shit in this, you know, they're hanging things off ports that were never designed to do that. Getting like 720p video drivers into it, upgrading into tower cases, putting PCI slots and soldering Zorro slots onto it. You name it, this, this thing got, you know, expanded to within a hundred times more than the original Commodore engineers imagined that it would. So uh, yeah, the Amiga 1200, we're gonna have a little look around it now like we always do. I'll put it down, we'll have a look at the ports, the internals, and then I'll show you a bit of the uh, machine in action. Right then, there she is in all her glory, the uh, Commodore Amiga 1200. Now, as I mentioned, mine isn't actually a Commodore manufactured model, um, as you can tell by the later Amiga logo there. And uh, I mean, apart from that though, everything else is identical. What ESCOM really did is, you know, take Commodore's designs, it was built out of mostly Commodore parts, uh, for all intents and purposes, it's an identical machine. There was a few slight differences, you know, they messed up the floppy disk drive in some of the ESCOM models by cheaping out on it and putting a PC drive in that was modified, but, you know, that had a few incompatibilities with games. Otherwise, you know, it's pretty much identical from all intents and purposes. Now, I mentioned that, you know, style and design-wise, it's very similar to the Amiga 600 that came out a few months before. There is the Amiga 600, which lacks a numeric keypad, Apart from that though, I mean, you know, it does look like a stretched Amiga 600 really. Not much difference. Uh, mine's actually a very nice example. Um, I mean, you can see, if I show you my A600 again, it is kind of yellowing a bit this machine, which unfortunately um, happens to a lot of old computers. This one though is in mint condition. Looks brand new. Completely, you know, snowy white, but I, I do actually keep it covered up, which I think is the secret to keeping your um, classic machines looking good. I put a tea towel over it. Simple as that. A lot of people think that the machine's actually yellow because you get ultraviolet light through your window and that, you know, kind of 
works with some of the uh, anti-inflammatory coating that they put on the plastic. That's what I've read online anyway, so I've always covered it up, make sure it's dark and no sunlight's getting on it, and it looks great. So uh, as we look at it here, we've got a full-size keyboard. Mine's the British model, so we've got the pound sign there and the quotes in the right place, not there. I don't like them on that key. Uh, we've got three lights here, a hard disk light, a floppy disk drive access, and a power light. That is because the Amiga 1200 can support a internal IDE two and a half inch hard disk. And they sold it in two models, actually. Now, uh, the Amiga 1200 originally came out in Britain in the desktop dynamite pack. Now that included a few games, I think it was Oscar was in there, it was one of them, Dennis and Menace I think was in there too. Uh, and there was Dulux Paint 4. A friend of mine, Martin, actually had one of those when we were at school. I was very jealous when I still had my Amiga 500 Plus at the time. Now uh, internally, we'll go a bit more in depth in a moment, but this came with the AGA chipset, originally known as a AA chipset, which means you got quite a big performance boost over the uh, previous generation Amigas. This could support um, graphics from a palette of 16.8 million colors. The previous generation Amigas only had 4,096. This also came with a 68020 processor at 14 megahertz. Now looking around the machine, on the side of it there, we've got the um, PCM CIA port, credit card port as it was often called in the magazines, and that was on the Amiga 600 before it. Very useful slot actually. Uh, on the back of it, all the Amiga ports that we know and love. Now, this here is actually an expansion port. Um, usually that would be covered up by a bit of plastic, but I've got an upgrade in mind which needs an external wire. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, we've also got the mouse and joystick ports here. Um, what's this one? That's floppy disk drive for an external floppy drive. A serial port, parallel to connect to a printer. Um, left and right audio jacks, RGB video app, color composite, which is quite nice. Uh, a built-in RF modulator and the power brick adapter. On the right side of it, no real surprises, we've just got a uh, 880k double-sided, double-density floppy disk drive. As I mentioned, mine's an ESCOM model and for some reason, yeah, look at that big gap there, didn't make it very well. So, let us have the machine looks on the outside. I'm going to take the screws out and we'll have a look how it looks internally. Okay then, so I've removed all of these screws underneath the A1200, so we'll uh, open it up and have a little look inside. So um, I'm trying to remove the lid here. What we'll do is we'll pull the keyboard back. Now there's actually a connector here. If we lift that up, I can remove the keyboard. So that should just slide away. And as you can see, there's a wire going through the top there, uh, which is for the LEDs at the top of the case. So we'll pull that out. That should all come apart quite nicely. We go. Now this is what my uh, Amiga 1200 looks like inside. It's kind of had a few uh, third party additions to it as you can tell. Doesn't look the tidiest I must admit but everything does kind of work quite well. Now uh, looking around the board here we've got the uh, PCM CIA credit card slot there. Uh, the AGA chipset which is here. We've got the Gale chip which was a replacement for Gary in the original chipset. Um, we've got the Kickstart ROMs here. Mine, as I mentioned, was a later edition Amiga uh, 1200, so it came with version 3.1, which is probably the best version um, of Amiga OS on the classic machines. That's the version that you want. That means you, you can then run the later releases like version 3.5 and 3.9, which or soft kick into 3.1, if you follow me. Um, I've got an expansion here as well, as uh, the Amiga 1200 had a trapdoor port on it as well, similar to the Amiga 500. So you can put expansions in here. Now this has full 32-bit address space on it. So that means you can plug accelerators and up to uh, 256 megabytes of RAM into it. So what I've got here is an 030 CPU upgrade. So what that'll do is it will then uh, bypass the onboard uh, 68020 processor, which is there. It will use the 030 on this instead of it. So it gives it a nice little speed boost, brings my machine up to 28 megahertz. And it's also got 64 megabytes of RAM on board. Twin that with the two megabytes that's built in, you know, gives me a nice little RAM upgrade there. Now, the internal IDE port is here. Originally, you get metal shielding on this, which I've had to remove because of my expansions. And there'd be a little cradle in there that you could then put a two and a half inch um, IDE hard disk into. Since then though, I mean, by far the most efficient way these days is to replace the hard disk with a compact flash card. 
Now a lot of these, I've got videos on this subject, can actually be run in hard disk mode. So what I've got here is, um, it's kind of, you know, not the tidiest. It's all insulated though, so nothing will short out. But I've got a 2.5 inch IDE to compact flash adapter cable. So as you can see there, I can then prepare this card here as a hard disk and it's a four gigabyte card. Now you think the original Amiga 1200s shipped with, I think it was a 40 megabyte hard disk I had in this. That's quite a bit of an improvement in space. So I've got pretty much every Amiga game ever made on this and a very nice, you know, Workbench 3.9 install on it too. So that works as the internal hard disk. It's completely silent as well. There's a, you know, no moving parts or anything. Now underneath here, we have two of the Amiga's graphics chips. Uh, we've got Alice, um, which was a replacement for Agnes on the original chipset, and Lisa. Now what I've got here is an individual computer's Indivision AGA Mark II. Now what this does is originally, by default, the Amiga outputs a variety of screen modes. Um, 15 Hertz PAL is the TV standard in the UK, or it was back then, you know, standard definition we're talking. This machine by default, and most of the games work in that resolution. However, you might want to look at high resolution screen modes, um, you know, for Workbench, for using the Amiga operating system, or you may want to connect this to a modern day Super VGA monitor. Now what this allows me to do, it clips directly over one of the custom chips, and then it takes a video output, reroutes it through this cable, which will then connect to a DVI port at the back. That means I can plug this into any computer monitor, and also I can use all of the Amiga screen modes without having to have like a specialist monitor. So back then you get what was called a multi-sync monitor, but they're very rare and expensive today. So that's a few of the upgrades I've got there. We've got the floppy disk drive there as well. Here is quite an interesting um, feature of the Amiga 1200. It's called the clock port. Now you can see on the motherboard there, hopefully, there are a few blank headers. Now some of the Amiga 1200s have a full clock port, some of them don't work at all. But originally this was designed to um, simply add a real-time battery back clock in because the Amiga 1200 by default doesn't have one of those. However, there have been all kind of things that have been hacked onto this port because it's got quite, you know, a lot of address space on it. It can access quite a lot of the rest of the machine. There have been, you know, third-party sound cards that have been released for this, 24-bit uh, samplers, I believe. There's also USB ports you can add to the Amiga 1200 by using a subway adapter on this port here. That'll then give you USB 2, I believe, you can get on it. Um, there's also been high-speed uh, networking devices. This port is very versatile. And you can actually get clock, sport, uh, clock port splitters, so you can get like, you know, an adapter that gives you a few of those. Really, really useful port. And as I mentioned before, it got used for something that Commodore never intended it to. So that's a bit of a look around the internals of the Amiga 1200. I don't really think there's much more, you know, anything of interest really to show you apart from that inside. So what we'll do now is we'll reassemble the machine and I'll show you it in its running environment. All right, so this is where my Amiga 1200 lives. Um, I've got a desk specifically for the Amiga 1200 before I had it on like some uh, old chest of drawers, but I thought, you know, it really did deserve its own workspace. So um, it's connected up to a 22 inch LCD uh, monitor stroke TV. I've also got quite a nice little sound system on it as well. Um, some Logitech speakers that have a nice decent subwoofer as well. So Amiga music booms through that thing. Uh, a Zipstick joystick that was always my favorite Amiga joystick, that one. We've got a Logic 3 speed mouse that I thought was a lot nicer than the uh, bundled mouse that you got with it. Um, also hooked up to it as well, you'll see that I've got an Amiga CD32 console. Now, I've done a video on that before, um, but really, the reason I have it there is um, not only to play CD32 games on my TV, I mean, that's hooked up via S-Video as well, but also um, I've got a cable there, a uh, serial cable that connects it into the serial port of my Amiga 1200, and allows me then to use the CD32 as a slave CD-ROM drive. Now, I could actually add, I did used to have actually um, an SCSI CD-ROM drive on my A1200, but I've since used the uh, PCMCIA port on the side there for a network interface cable. So that means I can get this machine online, which is very, very cool indeed. So uh, all that does, it turns, um, I mean, you can get these for next to no money now. I think this is about five pounds. Literally, you know, it's a PCMCIA to Ethernet adapter, and then I've got an Ethernet cable that runs into my router. Uh, also, on the back of the A1200, most of the ports of my machine are full. So we've got the uh, power adapter there, 
Now, rather than using the standard Commodore brick, I've actually got a uh, modified ATX power supply back there um, that has been modified with an Amiga plug on it. That really means that it's got a bit more juice to power all the accessories that I've got as the supply power supply is a little bit weedy. Uh, there we've got an RGB to SCART video cable. Now what that means is I can hook it up to the uh, SCART interface on this TV and it will give some pretty nice quality. Um, then we've got the two uh, audio outs that go into the monitor that then go out via that plug there into the uh, speakers. Hope you're following all this. Uh, there we've got a parallel printer cable and that goes into a, a little old Canon printer that I've got down there. Move that bit of paper. <laughs> there we go. I need some cable ties. It's quite a mess under here. So that's a little like Canon bubble jet that I use, you know, from time to time. Uh, then the serial port is filled with the uh, adapter for the CD32. We have uh, the joystick there and the mouse. And then next to it, which looks a little bit messy at the moment, as um, I sent my A1200 off for some upgrades, and Amiga Kit, who did my upgrade for me, uh, forgot to include the little mounting clip I had with that. They they took it out and then. I couldn't put it back inside the machine after that. So it's hanging out, out the back of it at the moment. I will find another one hopefully and remount that. But that has got a DVI plug on it as well. Now I'll show you the difference between the uh, standard Amiga modes and the Indivision in just a bit. Uh, but right now we're looking at the standard Workbench 3.9 screen um, that my machine boots into. So I'll put you back on the tripod and we'll have a little look around. All right then, so I've perched on the end of my desk and I'm gonna give you a little tour of the Amiga 1200, uh, the way I've got it set up. Now I mentioned that I can get this machine online um, and I've got some software on it called Genesis. So I click the icon down here in the dock. Uh, just to quickly explain, um, this dock that we've got down here and the icons and everything are different from the, uh, the stock machine install that came with it. This is a later version of the Amiga operating system. It was designed by a company called a Hagen Partner in the year 2000 this came out. Um, Amigro OS version 3.9, which is what I run on here. So I've got Genesis configured. All I do then is click online. Now I'm online. Then if we open, for example, an IRC client. Uh, let's try that then. It connects to the server. Now bearing in mind, this is only a uh, you know stock 14 megahertz machine with two megabytes of RAM. Mine's been upgraded to 28 megahertz and uh, 64 megabytes of RAM. Compared to most machines today, it's still a very weedy configuration, but you know, it holds its own. For doing simple stuff like this, I mean, I read email on it, you know, a lot of people are like, what do you use an Amiga for anymore? You know, for this, for a basic chat machine, I'm in a channel here, I can run IRC, um, and this is actually a pretty nice IRC client. And the IRC is actually what XChat was based off. So if it looks a bit familiar, you know, all these buttons down the bottom, that's because XChat the designers of XChat like the design of this so much they copied it. Now uh, we minimize that. Um, I've got a news group reader here as well. So we can look at like, you know, some of the groups I subscribe to uh, in there. Um, you know, it's quite a fully featured news group reader. That's quite nice. So there we can read, uh, you know, compsys.amiga.hardware. Now to be fair, um, use groups these days, I mean, they were quite interesting way back when, uh, but you know, they're pretty much full spam these days, aren't they, unless you use them for binaries. So uh, I don't really check the news groups all that much anymore, but it's nice to dip into once a year or so. And we've got iBrowse, which is a, uh, a browser that originally started on the Amiga back in around 1995. Uh, yeah, 1995 to 2001. Uh, and then this version of it that was 01 to 06. Now this was really the first web browser I ever used, iBrowse. Um, and it is, you know, it's a very outdated browser by today's standards. The uh, version of Flash that it had is, uh, and there was a third party version of Flash release for it, won't work with anything today. It's got JavaScript, but again, a very old version. It doesn't support CSS either. So uh, browsing a lot of modern websites is, you know, they're not gonna look right on it. But there are some sites, you know, like specific Amiga sites that look just fine on it, for example, uh, the Aminet here we can go on to. So load the page up there. And you know, we can search for programs, we can download Amiga software, which is still being made. I mean, there's you know things that were uploaded yesterday. Two of those are actually classic Amiga software. We've got Scum uh, Engine, which lets you run the old LucasArts games. Uh, it's also got tabbed browsing as well. Now I'm not sure if iBrowse was actually the first ever tabbed browser, but it must have been one of the first. Um, you know, I had it a long time before Internet Explorer did, which I don't think got it into like version 7, did it? 
So uh, we've got two tabs open at the top here. Bear in mind, I can still pull down that. I can use my Amiga Workbench in the background, you know, look at my files while this web page is loading. We've still got the IRC chat open in the background there as well. So, you know, all of these things are running in real time. And we've still got, you know, 52, 55, yeah, we've got about 55 megabytes left. So we're using about eight or nine megabytes here. So we can look at the forums there of Amiga World. We've got Aminet open at the same time. You know, the Amiga was really the first home multitasking machine. So uh, yeah, it's pretty cool for all that. Uh, what else do I do in it? Well, um, if we take it offline for a moment then, I'll show you uh, another feature that I use it for as well. So let's close all these programs down. And we'll take it offline. Now I mentioned that I've got a lot of games on here. Now there's um, there's a few different solutions for having menuing systems. I like iGame, I think that's my favorite. So all I do, click the iGame icon, then I've got a list of all the games that are installed on my machine. And I've got, you know, well 240 here actually. I've deleted a few over the years, but these are really the Amiga games that I, you know, the ones that are my, fa my favorite Amiga games of all time really. So if we look through something like Zool 2, all you do is literally, you click, double click on it, I'll turn my speakers on as well so we get the uh, Amiga music coming out. And then it will load it up. You don't need to put any floppy disks in or anything like that. What it basically does is you get disk images, put them on your hard disk, and then some software called um, WHD Load, a bit loud, will then allow you to run all the Amiga games directly from your hard disk or, in my case, the Combat Flash card that I've got in there. And these are, you know, the full versions of the game, you know, and they're really fast loading. You haven't got to wait for floppy disk access times or uh, all the stuff we had to do back in the day, you know, swapping floppy disks and everything, which was a bit of a nightmare. So as you can see, no waiting around for uh, disk access times or anything like that was straight in. It really is, I mean, if you're an Amiga gamer, the Amiga 1200 is by far, you know, the machine to get. And the good thing about it is, you know, when you're bored of the game, you've had enough, you want to play something else, press a button on the keyboard, it takes you straight back to the workbench. And then, you know, you can uh, load up something else. So, uh, you know, for gaming, it is really the, uh, the Amiga to get these days. As you can see, Z-Wolf is well, one of my all-time favorite games. Now, uh, the version of Zool that I loaded up a moment ago was um, the AGA version. Now, a lot of games, when the Amiga 1200 came out, got a special version that was only for the Amiga 1200 and the 4000. And that was what's called an AGA version of the game. Really, they've got more colors, um, they're a lot more rich looking, um, and also because we've got a faster processor, it means that, you know, the games could be a little bit more demanding as well. Here we are, Z-Wolf, one of my favorite um, Lander clones. I remember playing the original version on the uh, Acorn Archimedes, I think it was. So, uh, yeah, this is one of my uh, one of my favorite old school Amiga games. These early 3D graphics. It was a pretty amazing game, actually. So, of course, we've got all the uh, Amiga productivity software that we can run as well, um, for example, um, Word with Seven. I remember doing lots of my college work on this uh, back in the, the good old days. And you know, it was actually a pretty good competitor for Word at the time. Um, not quite as fully featured, but you know, for what I used it for, it was, uh, did the job and it had some nice, you know, true type fonts in it as well. Um, although I've got the wrong font color selected there. Can't remember how you change that, but yeah, that's Wordworth. Uh, and of course, other Amiga programs like uh, Dulux Paint. That got an update to support the AGA chipset too. A parroted version, I apologize. Um, yeah, we look at that, 256 colors we can paint with here. And you remember the original Amiga um, hardware had um, HAM, which was a, a display mode that allowed you to have 4,096 colors on screen at the same time. The AGA chipset came with something called HAM 8, uh, which allowed you to uh, you know, use a selection of up to 256 colors from 16.8 million. So, you know, these are organized. A palette down the bottom here, we've got like, you know, A, B, all the way up to Z. Big selection of colors. And uh, you can get some really nice graphics out of it, actually. Still to this day, I think, you know, the, uh, the Gilux Paint software that you got on the Amiga is by far the best for doing um, bitmap graphics with it. It was absolutely fantastic. So that was in HAM 6, that was an old Amiga um, screen mode, but yeah, so you know, it was actually a really nice software suite. So there we go, that's a bit of a look at the um, Amiga 
1200. Still to this day, my uh, all-time favorite home computer. It's absolutely fantastic and still loads of fun to play with as well. I mean, I've got next generation Amigas, you know, OS4 and Morphos machines and AROS, but there is something really heartwarming about using this original hardware and just enjoying computing as I remembered it then. And all the accessories I've got, this is kind of the machine that I would have dreamed to have owned as a kid. So there we go, the Commodore Amiga 1200. Happy 20th birthday. And uh, please feel free to leave me a comment, add me on Google Plus and Twitter, all the links are below.